as always, it's a blessing to be gathered together to hear God's word, and as we do tonight, to receive his gifts, even those gifts through the forgiveness of our sins, through the body and blood of Jesus Christ. A few announcements as we uh, begin today. Uh, one is, you've heard about it a lot, our church photo directory. We still have over 100 slots still available for the month of October. So if your family is one of those 100 slots that needs to be filled, please uh, consider signing up for them uh, in the narthex following service today. Um, also, this Sunday and this weekend, it's LWML Sunday here at church. And you know the, the wonderful work of the Lord that uh, the ladies of the LWML do, both here in our congregation, but truly throughout the world. Uh, for uh, this Sunday and this weekend, we encourage you to uh, take a look at the table that's set up in the narthex by the LWML to learn a little bit more about the work that they do. And if you'd like to support and encourage that work, there are uh, little light boxes available uh, on the table back there. Uh, if you are led to do so, feel free to take one home with you uh, to fill it up with, with your offerings in that way, and you can bring it back and return it to church uh, to support the ministry uh, in that way. And now, if you were here Sunday, you heard about it, but if you are here on Thursday nights, you may have missed it. Uh, last Sunday, uh, Sherry Ann Ports, who is a member of our church council and also our strategic planning committee, she shared with us in church about how the council is working on uh, not only our uh, mission statement, but truly what our vision statement is for our congregation and where we are going as a congregation. So to do that, the Church Council and the Strategic Planning Committee, they are working on a SWOT analysis to determine the strengths and weaknesses, the opportunities and the threats for our congregation. And they need our help in that. And so they produced a congregational survey that they are going to give out throughout the month of October. And we prayerfully ask that you uh, would fill it out, that you participate, that you take uh, just a few moments of your time and share your thoughts uh, with us and about our church. So there's three ways that survey will be available. One is you can go on uh, Pastor Darren's website at pastordarren.com and you can fill it out there. Two, if you receive our Friday email newsletter, there'll be a link for that in that email. Or three, throughout the month of October, probably starting this Sunday and then continuing throughout October, there'll be a hard copy available uh, for you to fill out here at church and return here at church. So we just want to let you know about that now, and we hope that you can help us out and participate in that. If you are interested in seeing the questions beforehand, there are, is a stack of those questions available uh, in one of the tables in the Narnifex as well this week. And with that, you'll see all of our, uh, our bells are set up. Uh, music ministries return here to church this Sunday with our choir and with our bells of praise, and so we look forward to to that and give thanks to God for the blessings of those music ministries uh, give to us. Tonight we continue on in our sermon series, our game day sermon series, and today our theme is crowd noise. You see, tonight we're talking about the spiritual discipline of silence. May God bless us as we do, may God bless us to grow together in our faith uh, this night. I invite you to join with me in a word of prayer as we begin our service. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for calling us together to hear your word, to receive your gifts. Lord, bless us too as we uh, meditate on the spiritual discipline of silence. Lead us in how uh, you would have us to go to embrace silence, that we might be better listeners. Listeners not only to those around us, but above all, to be better listeners to you and the word that you share with us. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. With that, we begin our service tonight in song, so I invite you to join with me as we sing together our first song.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So take a moment of silence for personal contemplation and personal confession of our sins. And then we pray together. Hear us, Lord, as we confess our sins to you. We pray that you would forgive us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Hear our prayer. Forgive our sins. According to your mercy, make us righteous in the blood of your Son. Brothers and sisters in Christ, hear the good news of mercy and grace spoken to you this day. Because of Jesus, you are forgiven. Because of Jesus, you have life. Because of Jesus, you have the promise of life forever in Him. And so, hear these words anew this day. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by His authority, I therefore forgive you of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Yes. Let us pray. Merciful Father, your patience and loving kindness toward us have no end. Grant that by your Holy Spirit we may always think and do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated as we prepare to hear God's word for us this day. First, our Old Testament reading, which also serves as the basis for our meditation this day, from the book of Job, chapter 2. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hands, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they came each from his own place. Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Nemethite. They made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson comes to us from the, the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, and beginning at verse 1, as we uh, begin for the next few weeks to read through the book of Hebrews for our uh, epistle lessons. Therefore, we must pay clo much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard it. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. 
It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This time I invite the congregation to stand as we hear together our Lord's words from the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And they were bringing children to Jesus that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. He took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. The congregation may be seated as we join in singing our sermon hymn, Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silent. As we continue on in our game day sermon series, and we know that just as a football team works and trains and practices throughout the week in preparation for their big game day on the weekend, so too should we as Christians also be in training, in training for the game days of our lives of faith. And you know, for the Christian, our game days, they don't just come around once a week. 
Truly, our game days are each and every day of our lives here on earth. And so it's fitting that we continue to talk about some of the spiritual disciplines that God has given us that we might stand firm, that we might be prepared for each new game day we face. Today's theme is crowd noise as we talk about the spiritual discipline of silence. And in past weeks, as we have done here, we also have a sermon outline available in your bulletin. So if that is helpful or beneficial to you as you read along and as we listen together to God's Word this day, I invite you to turn in your bulletin to that outline together. You know, in football, crowd noise plays a big part of the game, doesn't it? When it is so loud that you can't even hear the quarterback calling out, out the snap count, it's easy to start a play before you should. And when you're on defense, well, crowd noise or the lack thereof, it makes a difference too. Perhaps no one knows about crowd noise and silence and the importance they play in football any better than this guy. And I know you know who that is. Just watch Aaron Rodgers operate against opposing defenses at Lambeau Field. The Lambeau faithful they get quite loud when the opposing team has the ball, right? But when the Packers have the ball, well, the home crowd is silent. So silent, in fact, that opposing defenses can clearly hear every call that Aaron Rodgers makes. They can hear every inflection, every green 18 that he barks out at the line. In fact, it is often so silent, and defenders can hear Aaron so well, that it's hard for them not to jump off sides, to jump off sides again and again. And if you watch the Packers, you know that Aaron doesn't put all that work into trying to get guys to jump off sides just for a five-yard penalty, does he? No, he takes advantage of those free plays. In fact, this year, through just three games, Aaron Rodgers has gotten 11 free plays by getting the defense to jump off sides. And he's turned them into six big gains and two touchdowns. You know, crowd noise and silence definitely plays a part in the game of football. And the same is true in our lives as well. Today we'll be talking about silence. And really, of all the spiritual disciplines out there, this one, this one is perhaps the most mysterious to us. Because silence is not something that we get a lot of in our busy and hectic world. Think about it. When was the last time you had even just five minutes of total, complete silence? This reminded me of the children's book, Five Minutes Peace, by author Jill Murphy. Perhaps you've read it before. See, in this book, uh, the main character is a mama elephant. And the mama elephant, she wants just five minutes of peace. But there's three reasons why she can't get that peace. It's her three children that she loves very much. But her children, they have a lot of energy. And they don't give her five minutes peace no matter what. But mama elephant has an idea. She has a plan. So she makes herself some toast, she brews a pot of tea, and then she gives activities uh, to all of her kids. A book to read, a game to play, a musical instrument to keep them entertained because she's going to head upstairs. She's going to have a bath. She's going to have five minutes peace. I think you know what probably happens though, right? Not even a minute later, all of her kids decide that the game and the music and the book, well, they're fine, but they would rather be doing all those things in the same place as their mom is. And Mama Elephant still can't get even five minutes peace. Have you ever felt that way in your life? You know, if you have, well, you're not alone. In fact, Jesus felt that way too. Jesus practiced solitude and silence, and he wrapped it up in prayer. And we see recorded time and again in the Gospels that this very thing. But in each of these instances, it didn't take long for the silence 
to be interrupted, for people to come looking for him, just like the little elephants came looking for their mother in that story. Even Jesus, it seems, had trouble getting five minutes peace. So this takes us then to our text for this day, where we meet a man who's in a very unpeaceful situation. His name is Job. We remember the words we heard earlier. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God, who turns away from evil. He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. And then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he, he will curse you to his face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the soles of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. You know, you've probably heard the story of Job before, even if you haven't studied the book yourself. And you probably know the basic premise, right? The basic premise that Job, he's a really good guy, but some really bad stuff happens to him. Satan goes to God and says, God, Job doesn't serve you wholeheartedly. If bad stuff happens to him, if you don't protect him, he will forsake you. And so God allows Satan to test Job But let's notice this. God knows that Satan is testing Job, right? And Satan knows that Satan is testing Job. And we, you and I, we know that Satan is testing Job. Who doesn't know that Satan is testing Job? It's Job. All he has is pain and no answers. All he has is silence. And not the kind of silence that all of us would lawn for. Rather cold and hard and gut-wrenching silence. Silence from God. It leads Job to say in Job 30, I cry out to you, O God, but you do not answer. I stand up, but you merely look at me. Job is being tested to his limits by the devil. He cries out to God, and what does he hear in return? Silence. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt that? What does it mean when God is silent? You know, I'm sure that's a question that Job would have liked to have an answer for, and it's one that we probably would like to have an answer for too sometimes. The truth is that when God is silent, we don't always know what to make of it. We aren't always given an answer. But from God's Word, we can say what God's silence doesn't mean. So let's say that today. When God is silent... Silence doesn't mean inactivity. We see this in Romans 8, in the famous words of St. Paul when he says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. You see, God is not disengaged from the lives of His people. He is always at work, attending to our needs, working through all things for the benefit of and the blessing of you and of me. Just because God is silent doesn't mean that he's inactive. Number two, silence does not mean sinfulness. You know, if God isn't inactive in his silence, then the next logical step for us to make would say that God must be silent because we 
are sinful. Because he has turned his back on us because of our sin. No longer will he answer us. No longer will he care. He has forsaken us. But that's not the case either, is it? In the very first chapter of Job, we see him described like this. That man, Job, was righteous and one that feared God. See, God's silence with Job, it was not because of his sin. And God doesn't give us the silent treatment because of our sin either. And then three. Silence does not mean silence. Just because we think or feel like God is being silent doesn't mean that He really is. You know, sometimes, sometimes the problem is not that God is silent, but it's that we aren't listening. Reminds me of an old story. I'm sure you've heard it before. It was of the man whose house was in danger of being washed away in a flood. And the man prayed to God and he said, Oh God, save me. Save me from these waters that are rising. And a few moments later, he heard a knock on his door and a fireman was standing there when he opened it and he said, Sir, come with me. We've driven our fire truck through the flood waters. We've come to save you. Please come with us. And the man says, Oh no, no, no. I asked God to save me. God will save me. Thanks, but no thanks. The man goes back in his house and he prays again, God, save me from these floodwaters. And a while later, the floodwaters have risen some more. And so now the man has to go to the second story of his house to stay out of the waters. And a little while later, he sees a boat passing by. It's his neighbor. And his neighbor says, neighbor, come on, swim out to me. Get in the boat. We can go to safety. And the guy who owns the house says, no, I prayed. I prayed for God to save me. And he will. Thanks, but no thanks. A while later, the waters have risen even more, and so the man goes to stand on the roof of his house, the only dry place left. And again, he prays to God, Lord, save me. Save me from these waters. And again, a little while later, a helicopter comes. They throw down a rope and they say, Sir, get on. Grab hold of the rope. We will save you. We will take you away. And again, the man says, No. God will save me. I'll wait for him. Thanks, but no thanks. Of course, we can probably tell how the story ends, right? The waters continue to rise, and eventually the man's house, and he with it, is swept away, and the man dies. And then, later on, when the man gets a chance to talk with God in eternity, he says, God, what were you doing? You weren't listening. You weren't responding. I prayed to you three times to save me, and you did nothing. And of course, God says, well, I didn't do nothing. I sent a fire truck, and I sent a boat, and I sent a helicopter, and you, you refused them all. Sometimes the problem is not that God is silent, but rather that we aren't listening. Other times... The problem is not that God is silent, but it's that we don't like His answer. You know, the most useful and the most poignant example of this is simply this. When a loved one is very sick, what do we do? When they're sick in need, we pray for them. We pray that they will get better. We pray that God would heal them, that He would take away their sickness. And sometimes God does, but not the way we want. Sometimes God heals people of their sickness, not here on earth, but in eternity, in heaven. In those cases, it's not that God is silent. It's that he's healing in a different way. Just because we don't like God's answer doesn't mean he is silent to our prayers. So that leads us to ask ourselves this question, then why should we practice this spiritual discipline of silence? The truth is, it's for our good, but also it's for the good of others. You see, the value of silence is not that we just get a little bit of peace and quiet. The value of silence is that it teaches us to listen better. 
Some of you may recognize this man. His name's Dale Meyer. He's the president of Concordia Seminary St. Louis, and he's also shown up in some of the videos that we've played throughout this sermon series. In addition to his role as being president at the seminary, he also is a professor of homiletics at the seminary, which is just a complicated way of saying he teaches seminarians how to preach. He's a preaching professor, and he's very good at preaching. You know, one day I remember in a class, a seminarian looked at Dr. Meyer and he asked this question. He said, Dr. Meyer, what do you do? What do you do when you look out at the congregation and you can see that they're not paying attention, that you've lost them, that they're thinking about something else, that they have checked out? What do you do? What do you say? Do you tell a funny story? Do you raise your voice? What is it to get their attention? I remember that Dr. Meyer thought about it, but then he said, you know, the best way, the very best way to get people's attention is to say nothing at all. Silence. And the longer the silence, the greater the attention. It's true, isn't it? Nothing gets people's attention more than silence. And in turn, silence, it teaches us to listen better. Silence also does one other thing. It teaches us to be slower to speak. And that can provide an unmeasured blessing for those around you. We see this happen in Job's story as we see his three friends come to visit. And if you've heard Job's story before, you all know that these three friends, they don't always offer Job the best spiritual guidance, do they? In fact, sometimes they have just plain bad advice. They have foolish instructions. They don't have much to offer in the way of consolation at all. But when they first come to see Job, his friends do something incredible. Do you remember what they did? At first, they didn't recognize him. But then, when they came and saw him there at the very end, in verse 13, we see this. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. Job's friends were by his side in mourning, but no one said a word. Their gift to Job was presence and silence. Sometimes that's the best thing we can give to another at times when we just don't know what to say. Have you ever experienced a time like that when you just didn't know what to say? Often we experience times like that at funerals. And sometimes, even when we're trying to say something comforting and trying to say something well-intentioned, it can be heard as anything but. Perhaps when someone says, well, they're, they're in a better place. But the person who's going through the grief or the mourning may hear that and say, well, but they're not here with me. I'm still stuck here. And that hurts. Or perhaps someone tries to comfort someone with the words, well, you should celebrate. You should celebrate the good times. But the person who hears it in their grief, they, they hear it and they say, well, this, this isn't a very good time. In fact, I can't even remember some of the good times right now. Or when someone says, well, I know exactly how you feel. And again, well-intentioned. But so often those words may leave the person who hears them feeling like you don't. How could you know what I'm feeling right now? Sometimes the best thing to say is nothing at all. Sometimes what is needed is not words, but you. Sometimes presence with silence is more important than any words at all. And so this is something else that silence teaches us. It teaches us not to speak too quickly. That's a hard lesson for us, isn't it? 
It's a hard lesson because we live in a world where we respond to everything really fast. We see it in the news media all the time, don't we? In an effort to break a story first and fast, news organizations also often get the story wrong altogether. We remember the horrible events at the Boston Marathon bombing. And one news outlet, in trying to get the story out there before anyone else, the New York Post, they released this cover with a picture of two men saying the feds were looking for these two men as their suspect. Well, as you know, as it turned out, these two men weren't suspects at all, but they were some of the victims in trying to respond quickly. It was not good. We remember, too, in the news uh, a while back, the the debate about the the new health care marketplace. And the debate was so great that it even went to the Supreme Court to say if it was constitutional or not. And so all the news organizations were waiting to hear the word, yay or nay. And CNN.com ran this page saying that it was struck down. They wanted to be first to reply, but... In actuality, they got the story wrong altogether. Not good. And for those of you who are history buffs, or for those of you who are blessed with more years of life than me, perhaps you remember this famous picture from the Chicago Daily Tribune. Harry Truman was so excited holding up the newspaper story that said, Dewey beats Truman. He was excited because the story was wrong. In their race to be first, They got the info wrong altogether. Not good. But you know what? The news media, they're not the only ones guilty of responding too quickly. We all are in our life. We respond hastily to family members. We snap at others. We hit send without thinking. And worst of all, we lash out at God when things aren't going our way. Thanks be to God that he doesn't respond in the same way. You know, when we confess our sins to God, he doesn't reply with wrath and rage, but rather with forgiveness and grace because his son has paid the price for our sins. And when we are confused or lost, God doesn't cast us out, but rather he invites us back and he even goes to look for us when we wander away. And when we are hurting, God doesn't respond with irritation or frustration. Rather, He gives us His Spirit to comfort us in times of need and to remind us of Jesus. You see, our Heavenly Father responds to us in love, forgiveness, and grace. He saw the first sin of Adam and Eve, and He announced to the world that He would send a Savior, His very own Son, so that you and I could have forgiveness and life. Forgiveness for our lack of silence. Forgiveness for our hasty responses and our hurtful words. Forgiveness for all the times that we've run away from silence and in so doing, run away from listening to the words of our God. You see, we have a Heavenly Father who loves us and who invites us to practice this spiritual discipline of silence for the blessing and the benefit of those around us but also so that we can listen better. So that we can better hear the words of grace and life that continually flow through His Word and into our hearts for the strengthening of our faith. So that we can always be prepared for each new game day that He blesses us with to come. In Jesus' name and for His sake, Amen. Having heard this word of God proclaimed this day, we have the opportunity to confess together our common Christian faith, and we'll do so this night through the words of the Nicene Creed as printed in your bulletin. For that, I invite the congregation to stand. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, 
and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we worship the Lord with our offerings. And as always, I encourage you to fill out the record of fellowship and pass it to those sitting next to you so that following the service you can greet them by name in the name of the Lord. As we continue our service in prayer, I invite the congregation to stand as we pray together. Holy God, we lift our hearts to you in prayer, trusting in your promise to hear us for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for those who are sick or are in need in any way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who mourn. Lord, be with all those who mourn at this time and give them the comfort and the peace that only you can give. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who celebrate, including Grace Flash as she celebrates her 91st birthday this weekend. And we pray for Don and Dorothy Bird as they celebrate their 53rd wedding anniversary this week. Lord, thank you for the blessings you have showered upon these, your servants. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the work of the Lutheran Women's Missionary League in our midst and around the world. Strengthen and equip the LWML and its members to serve the Lord with gladness all of their days for the blessing of those around us and for the glory of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Take all we have, our time, our talents, and our treasures, and use them all to your glory and in your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We hear the words of our Lord. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, this do, in remembrance of me. The same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The congregation may be seated and invite forward for communion in just a moment. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ may it strengthen you in faith both now and to life everlasting. Depart in our Lord's peace, forgiven and free from all of your sins. Amen. And receive the Lord's blessing as you depart. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. May the Lord bless you not only this day but throughout the week ahead as we as God's people we prepare for game day as we seek out that spiritual discipline of silence so that we might hear God speaking to us but also so that we might minister and be a blessing to those around us in our world may the Lord bless you in that we close our service by singing together 
our final hymn.